good to see you this morning. If this is your first time with us, my name is Andrew, and I'm the lead pastor of New Life East. Um, like Pastor Collins said, this is, it's, it is funny. I was telling the, the group, we had these December meetings here in the cafeteria, worshiping and praying together, enjoying God's presence, just kind of getting ready for what the Lord would do. And I kept saying to them, you know, Mandy and I uh, have been in the church long enough that we've been through different cycles of church life. And you never really realize when you're living in the good old days until the good old days are done. And so, you know, you know what I mean? And so thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. So I've made a determination in my soul with this project here, New Life East, that uh, I'm just going to enjoy the good old days when I'm in them. And so being in the cafeteria was awesome. And that's done. And these preview services, haven't they been sweet? I mean, this has just so exceeded our expectation for what these were going to be like. I think we kind of had a sense that, you know, we'd use these services to kind of work out some kinks and it might be a little bit messy and sloppy. And then we just showed up the first Sunday of January and it was like we were having church, which I'm okay with uh, because I like church a lot. But really, first, I just want to say I want to give so much credit to our team for pulling this all together. And so Pastor Colin and Susan Wood and Jillian and Jeff and team, Blake and Evan, Dan Malinarek, all the setup crew, Shailene Smith. Man, these guys are rock stars. They're busting their humps to make this happen. And this has been a great experience for us, largely in part because, uh, largely because they've been the tip of the spear on this. So thank you guys for all of the hard work that you put into this. It just means the world uh, to all of us. Uh, second thing is, Next Sunday is launch Sunday. And uh, you say, Andrew, what's your expectation for next Sunday? Like, what's it going to be like? I don't know. (laughs) What I do know is that we've done all of the work that we can do. Mailers have gone out and we've prayed a whole bunch. And you all have been inviting your friends and your neighbors and your family. And so what we're doing is we're going to show up next Sunday like this. With open arms, with open hearts, ready to receive people. And uh, this is not, um, sometimes growth is like a funny thing in the church. It kind of has like these weird uh, associations with it. Um, Healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. And the Lord has been growing this community, New Life Church, for a long time. This is good, healthy growth that's happening here. And I was telling Pastor Brady this week, I said, one of the things that's been so joyful about the New Life East journey to this point is that so many of you that are in the story with us right now, you had settled in your heart ahead of time that this was where you needed to be. You know, we had about a year where we were kind of talking about East, but no real announcements or timelines had been made. And then the moment the announcement happened, everybody really locked in. So this is a group of people from New Life Church who have said yes to what the Spirit's doing here. So what are we doing next week? It's hospitality. We're opening up our hearts. We're opening up our space so that those who don't yet know Jesus or don't have community can come and taste and see that the Lord is good. So... Some of you are on volunteer duty for different things next week, ushers and greeters and the kids ministry and all that stuff. And some of you aren't. But if you're in this building, would you consider yourself a part of the ministry and be kind to people and open hearted to people and find out their names and their stories and their kids names and where they play soccer and what they like to do. Just be open hearted to them. I think that the Lord is going to give us people to the extent that he can trust us with people. And so let's show up next week with open hearts. Can you do that? Some things that you can do practically, continue to invite people. Let's pack this place out, two services, 9 and 11. You also can follow us on social media if you haven't yet. uh, I think Instagram is at New Life East and Facebook is New Life East. So follow us there. You can spread some of the stuff around the social media thing. It's a thing now in 2020. It really like it draws people in. The internet is like a front door for folks. So get the word out about New Life East and we'll have a great Sunday next Sunday. I'm finishing up first things. Holy smokes, is it 1145? Oh, Jesus, help him. <laughs> Finishing up first thing. <laughs> Tim goes, you got this, man. Here we go. Rapid fire preaching. It's first things this morning. We're finishing up. I want to talk about prayer at the time that we have left. I'm going to be in Exodus chapter 33. So we talked about the Bible the first week. Talked about church the second week. Talked about generosity last week. And now I just want to talk about prayer how prayer situates us in God's presence and what it does and all the good stuff. So I'm going to do my best to try to keep this to 20 minutes or so so we can end at 12.15. And uh, we're going to need to pray if we're going to do that. So Lord, here we are. Here we are. We thank you. We thank you 
for the invitation of the Spirit to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. We thank you that Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, you said that you were the vine and that we were the branches, that if we remained in you and you remained in us, we would bear much fruit. And apart from me, we can't do anything at all. And so we stand here this morning as folks that cannot do anything at all apart from Jesus Christ. We ask that the words of scripture this morning would remind us of our already always identity in Jesus Christ, that we would lean into him and abide in him that we would root ourselves down deep in the presence and draw strength up from the life-giving stream that's always under us and around us all the time. Grant that we're asking. I pray that where there is staleness, that you would bring freshness to us. Remind us of how good this whole thing is and how it can be trusted. Grant that we're asking. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and everybody said... One of my favorite images for prayer, Exodus 33, and verse 7, the scripture says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. I love that. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would come to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all of the people rose and they stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and they worshipped each at the the entrance to their tent. Isn't that a great image? They're watching Moses go to the tent of meeting. Everybody emerges from their tent and they stand and they worship the God of Israel as Moses goes into the tent of meeting and communes with the living God. And then there is this picture of what happens inside. The scripture says that there in the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses. What does the scripture say? Face to face as a person speaks to their friend. That is as good a picture of the life of prayer as I think you're likely to find in the scriptures. That Moses in the midst of his responsibilities In the midst of his tasks, in the midst of his leadership in Israel, he knows that if he does not have an ongoing personal encounter with the living God, he just won't make it. And so he sets up a tent outside the camp and he goes into the tent and the scripture says that the Lord speaks to him face to face as a person speaks with their friend. Now, we live in 21st century United States of America. We're all about our personal space. Okay? So when we talk to people, we don't get all that close. But in Middle Eastern countries, in other places of the world, you know that it's just different. If you really care about a person, personal space is not really a thing. And so when the scripture says face-to-face as a person speaks to their friend, we're not talking about some polite distance here. We're talking about speaking with God so close that you can feel the breath of God on your face. And God can feel your breath on his face. It's that kind of intimacy. And that's the kind of intimacy that Moses shared with the Lord. One of the things that's interesting about this is that it says that the Lord would speak to Moses, right? Now, we always think about prayer as stuff that we say to God, don't we? So we think about prayer as, okay, I'm in prayer now. What are the prayer words? What do you say? But maybe prayer isn't so much about that. Maybe prayer is more about coming into the tent of meeting and letting the face of God come so close to you that you can feel the the breath of God upon your face. It's receiving the very words of God. And in that encounter that Moses had with God, something happened to Moses. The scripture says that every time he came out from the tent of meeting or the times that he came down from Sinai after having communed with the Lord, the scripture says that his face was radiant because he had spoken to God. In fact, there was such glory on Moses' face, such glory in his demeanor, such glory on his countenance that the Israelites were terrified of it. (sighs) Like looking into these spotlights back there. Oh, right, you can't do it. And so what Moses started doing is he would put a veil 
over his face so as not to scare them. And when he would go into the tent of meeting, he would take the veil off of his face so that that communion could happen. And then when he would come to the people, he would put the veil and then he would bring the words of God to them. Moses' whole life as a prophet, as a leader in Israel was constituted by that motion back and forth between the presence of God, communion with God, and then his presence with the people. And of course, Moses, even his experience and encounter with God, it was mitigated in some way. In Exodus chapter 33, a little bit later in this text, we learn that God actually says to Moses that you can't see my face and live. So the face of God was veiled to Moses, but it was there in an invisible way. Moses is pressing in, pressing in, pressing into the darkness, trying to behold the face of God, hear the voice of God, dwell in the presence of God. And the scripture closes, the Pentateuch closes, Deuteronomy chapter 34 with this comment about Moses. It says that since then no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. There's something about Moses that became almost paradigmatic for the people of God. Like they had this hope and this expectation that at some point in history, another one would arise like Moses, who also knew the Lord face to face, who also knew the Lord intimately, who also knew the Lord personally, who carried the glory with them. That's how the Pentateuch closes, like closes, like God, we need somebody else like that to arise. And what the church believes is that in Jesus, we are seeing the prophet who is not just like Moses, but we're seeing the prophet who is so much greater than Moses. Because whereas the face of God was veiled to Moses, it was hidden in secret from eternity past to eternity future, Jesus the Son always sees the face of his Father in heaven, unmitigated, undiminished, unblocked. But the Son beholds the Father, and the Father beholds the Son. And when the Son takes on human flesh, That story that he'd always been living with the Father from before all worlds, he now lives among us in space and time. Jesus is the prophet like Moses, and not just like Moses, but so much greater than Moses. Luke has this wonderful commentary. When you look at the life of Jesus, really what you're seeing is the life of one who lived in a constant state of being in the presence of God. And then bringing the wisdom and the power of the presence of God to bear on people's lives. This commentary from Luke, I think, tells the tale so beautifully. The scripture says, this is early on in the ministry of Jesus. The scripture says that the news about Jesus spread all the more. So that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Don't you love that commentary? Like Jesus wasn't out there trying to drum up something. Okay? And in the same way, we don't need to be out there kind of trying to drum up something. But the life of Jesus was radiant as Moses' face was radiant. The life of Jesus was magnetic. It was powerful. There was something about it. The glory leaked out from him. The power leaked out from him. And so people came from miles around. They heard about the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They heard about the one who healed the sick and raised the dead and cleansed the lepers and spoke truth straight from the heart. God. And so they came, they hung on his every word. The scripture says that they came to him from everywhere. But Jesus, verse 16, often withdrew to the lonely places and he prayed. That what Jesus did is he constantly, like Moses, with the people and then away from the people. With the people and then away from the people. Jesus constantly renewed his communion with the Lord. And in verse 17, we read this. That one day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there and they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And what does the text say? That the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Brothers and sisters, this is what the life of prayer does. That the life of prayer positions us right inside the flow of the grace of God. That it positions us right inside what God is doing, whatever that might be in the moment. And when we look at the life of Jesus, the spiritual insight and the power that came from him were not just the product of his being a superman. He wasn't just this especially charismatic guy. He kind of had some neat bells and whistles and kind of got stuff done in Galilee. But Jesus was one who lived before the face of his father in heaven, always and at all times. 
And because he lived in the, before the face of his father in heaven, he spoke spiritual wisdom and spiritual insight. And he moved in great spiritual power. You remember the great scene in John chapter 8. A woman had been caught in the act of adultery. And a bunch of the town leaders found her and they grabbed her and they brought her and they threw her down before Jesus. And they said, Jesus, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone a woman who was caught in this kind of a situation. And now, now what do you say that we should do? Do you remember how the story goes? That Jesus got down on his knees and he started writing in the dirt. And we have no idea what Jesus was writing. What was he saying? Was he listing out the Decalogue? Was he writing verses from the Psalms or from Deuteronomy? What was Jesus doing? Was he writing their names? Was he drawing pictures? We don't know what Jesus was writing, but they kept questioning him. Jesus, what do you say? They're trying to throw him into conflict with Moses. Jesus, what do you say? Moses told us to kill her. What do you say? We know that you're this kind of gracious guy and you're very nice and merciful to people. Are you going to show yourself to also be bloodthirsty? What are you going to do? They're trying to force him into a double bind. And Jesus stands up and he says, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. That he spoke a word of such spiritual depth and wisdom that it broke the spiritual power of the situation. Just like that. And the scripture says that one by one, they began to drop their stones and walk away until nobody was left but Jesus standing there with the woman. And he looks at the woman and he says, woman, where are your accusers? She says, I don't see them anymore, sir. They're gone. And he says, rise up, go now, leave your life of sin. Everybody is liberated in that moment. And you and I have stood in those places, haven't you? Where things were tense. You could feel the energy building. And you just long in those moments for somebody to say the word, to drop the thing, to, make the, to do the action that somehow breaks the spiritual power of the situation. That is who Christ the Lord is. And he can do that because he dwells continually in the presence of God. And Jesus goes on in John chapter 8 to give this explanation. This is just a little while later in that text. To give this explanation of his activities, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am he and that I do, everybody say it loud, nothing on my own. I do nothing on my own, but I speak just what the Father has taught me. And the one who sent me is with me and he has not left me alone, for I, I always do what pleases him. Jesus was one who lived ongoingly in the presence of God. And actually, when you read the Gospels, the sense that you get from the Gospels is that Jesus was almost more with God when he was with people than he was with people. What was Jesus doing in that moment when he was drawing in the dirt? I think what he was doing was he was saying, Father, what are you saying? Father, what are you saying? Father, what is your heart? What is your heart? What is your longing? God, show me how much you love this woman and show me how much you love these people. Show me, oh God, how desperate you are to see to it that these people do not have this woman's blood on their hands today. Blood will not be spilled today. Show me the way through, Father. But that's what Jesus was doing. He was sniffing around for the wisdom of God, for the presence of God, for the life of of God, he was sniffing for the kingdom, looking for the kingdom. That, brothers and sisters, is the life of prayer. And too many Christians, what we do is we take prayer and we relegate it to certain discrete moments. And we go, did I do it then? Did I have my 15 minutes with Jesus? Check. Jesus is happy now with that. Now I'm going to go do my other things in life. Check. And I'm going to pay my tithe. Check. Go to church. Check. And we lead these unintegrated, religious, legalistic existences. And the world is unchanged by it. And how could it be changed by that? There's enough religion to go around. And there's enough box checking to go around. And there's enough Deepak Chopra spirituality to go around. Where we just sort of have these private existential experiences that are nice. And then we go off and do our thing. 
Prayer, guys, is not simply a box that we check. It's not just a discrete activity that we do, but it's a life that we live. You ask the question, what is prayer? I answer that prayer is the act of entering into communion with Jesus, whereby we become as he is in the world. God's will is not that the life of Jesus remain enclosed in the first century. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, what God has done is he started including human beings in the life of Jesus so that that kind of spiritual depth and insight and power that we see in Jesus, that that is us too. That because we dwell in the presence of God, because we see the face of God as it is revealed to us in the face of Jesus Christ, we become as Christ is. Paul said it so beautifully, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. He said that he's deliberately comparing our experience to that of Moses. Paul says that we who with unveiled faces contemplate the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his likeness with what? Ever increasing glory comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Don't you understand, like Moses' experience was an experience of veiledness. Veiled before the people, he'd take off his veil in the presence of God, but he couldn't quite see the face of God and that glory that he experienced then when he'd take it to the people. Paul actually says that one of the reasons that he veiled his face is not just because they were afraid, but because he didn't want the people to know the secret that when he was out of the presence of God, the glory started diminishing on him. So he's trying to protect his credibility, his authority with the people. And Paul says that we who are in Christ Jesus, we are so much greater than Moses. That we have seen the glory of God in the face of Christ. And because we continually see the glory of God in the face of Christ, the glory does not diminish in us. But the glory grows in us. And it increases in us. And it explodes in us to the world. Which is why Paul says, that what are you going to do? You don't pray at discrete times. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that you pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. How do you do that? How do you do that? Here's what I've learned. What I've learned is that I must make a deliberate effort to turn my thoughts continually to God. That's how you do it. That's the big secret. You say that sounds hard. It is hard. At first. But then something starts happening to you over time. It becomes a force of habit. That I'm not looking here and then looking there. I'm not looking at the earth and then looking to heaven. I'm not looking at people and then looking at God. But what I'm doing is I'm looking at people through the lens of God. And I'm trying to assess situations via the presence of God. And I'm trying to pay attention to my neighbors inside of the kingdom of God. And what happens as you begin to turn your mind to the presence of God, there's like this synoptic thing that takes place. That heaven and earth start blending together and they become one picture for you. And the scriptures, brothers and sisters, heaven is not something up in the clouds. Heaven is our total environment. Which is why when Jesus came, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is... It's near. It's at, literally another way it says it's at hand. It's here and now. It's right now all the time. And so what God's people do is they wake up to the presence of God. They live woke in the deepest sense possible. To the reality of God and his kingdom. To the reality of Christ and his mercy. To the reality of the spirit and the miracles that the spirit is working. And I just have the sense that as we're heading into this season of welcoming and receiving new people into this community and also engaging in God's mission to this neighborhood, God is calling some of you to rise up in prayer in a fresh way. And not simply prayer as discrete moments, though please and by all means do that. Now, one of the things that anchors for me that life of continually turning my imagination to God is that the habit of early morning prayer has been instilled in me. So it's like that to me is like priming the pump. <laughs> You wake up all bleary-eyed and you don't know what day it is or what your name is or how old you are. 
And the first thing that you do is you bring yourself into the presence of God and you start reading scripture and presenting yourself to God and receiving from the Holy Spirit. What that does is that's priming the pump. <laughs> It's getting you inside the flow of God's spirit. It's getting you inside the flow of God's mercy. But God's dream is not for us to just stay there. It's for us to bring ourselves into Jesus' presence at all times and then let his presence be the means by which we bring blessing to the world. We're called to tuck ourselves into Jesus Christ.